Hello everyone, welcome indeed to this uh, webinar. So I will be giving today an introduction to the radiation technology. So of course at the end of the webinar, we will have time to allow you asking all the questions you might have. Otherwise, of course, you can address them through directly to Rob and Paul or to myself directly. So during this uh, webinar, so let me check. During this uh, webinar, the purpose will be, of course, to give you an overview of what meaning uh, radiation technologies, what meaning radiation processes. After that, um, I will dive a little bit into all the different technologies, um, that is to say in the gamma sourcing, the electrode beam source, and in the X-ray source as well. Later on, I will compare them, I would say, and to check how we can make some similarities and differences between all the different uh, radiation technologies. And we will go ahead with the application, the main benefit of it. And I will make also uh, a dive into the sterility and how we can achieve the sterility a bit with all the different radiation technologies. And of course, I will give you some remaining challenges, of course, and how we can solve the remaining challenges and we can see the path forward. And uh, at the end, I will give you some trends and upcoming uh, development uh, we have uh, within the pipeline in our community. So let's start, first of all, through the induction to give you an overview of what's going on. So right now, I think it's important to have in mind uh, the history of the radiation processing and how this has been turned into the radiation technology. So you might have in mind that uh, the X-ray was discovered in the late 19th century in 1895 by Rodgen. And uh, some you know, for one year after and two, three years after, we observe and uh, we know Pierre and Marie Curie with Henri Becquerel as well discovered the radioactive element and so forth. We need to wait almost for more than 60 years to get some industrial application of the dis this discovery. So the beginning or late 50s, beginning of the 60s, we indeed saw the first opening of some industrial radiation plant to be able to either process spices or to do some other medical devices. And for the use of the X-ray, in that case, we need to wait more than one century after to see what we call, I would say, the first industrial radiator coming from working with X-ray. And this was opened in Switzerland at Danikel in 2010. And what we can see now from 2022, that several X-ray plants are open, are really in place, especially in Europe, and a lot of other worldwide are construction. That means that between the discovery and the application, almost 60 years for the gamma and almost more than one century for the X-ray. But we'll see that now they are quite mature technology at the end. So just a question of semantics, Prior, I was really to dive into that topics um, and maybe to make a clear distinction to what we'll be calling modalities and what we can call technology. When we talk about sterilization modalities, and I think it is really important to have in mind, it's just a question of semantics, but it's really important. When we talk about modalities, we're talking about it sterilization, for instance, chemical, that is to say with ethylene oxide, abraved EO, and on the other side by ionizing radiation. And here, of course, during this webinar, the purpose is really to focus on the different technology using ionizing radiation. The purpose is not to talk about the other modalities, but really to stick to the technology of radiation, ionizing radiation. So we'll be covering that. So now, I want you to have in mind and to give you, I want to give you also an overview and what we will be discussed uh, during this webinar. So, of course, uh, we'll be talking about the gamma ray, the back gamma ray technology. So, all of us already may know that, of course, the purpose of uh, the gamma rays are produced by the radioactive 
radioactive element called the cobalt 60. As I said, it was installed first of all in 1963 in the US um, and worldwide we have approximately 200, 250 installations using the, this um, radioactive material emitting gamma rays. And I think uh, everybody knows already it's a very well defined sterilization technology for the sterilization of medical devices and other pharmaceuticals and biologics as well. On the other side, we have also a, a, a photon-based technology we call the X-ray. In that case, we don't use a radioactive element, but we use what we call, it is an electron-based irradiators. And we can see that later on, we'll see how we transform uh, E-beam to X-ray and how it is under after that. So the first, I would say, installation was the really uh, developed and open beginning of the 2002, especially to uh, deal with the US mail. But really, the first commercial uh, say installation really uh, came up in, in 2010. And in the other side, we have the other technology working with electron. In that case, also it is a, as it is a ionizing radiation technology, it uses high energy electron. And it is, uh, I would say, quite mature technology, which has been used more than 50 years now. And we have worldwide several hundred or even 7,000 of units installed worldwide. We can see that the main, I would say, the main use, the main application for the E-beam is rather uh, polymer modification on purpose for crosslink cables, wire, film, and, and so on. And the other side to sterilize all, all I would say, all medical device on all other stuff. So the purpose of this webinar is really to dive into these three technology and to compare them and to compare, I would say, from application point of view, some sterilization point of view, and from understanding point of view how it works and what how we can deal with. So I think also it's important to have in mind, and I will be keeping talking during my uh, talk about electron photon to have in mind what is the neutron and what is the photon and what could be the differences between these two particles. So first of all, what is an electron? I, I think it is important to have in mind that electron is really a subatomic particle with a charge, with a negative electric charge. Due to this charge, due to the fact that electron has a mass, that means that they will have a strong interaction with other atoms or with other with the matter in general because of this uh, or it will find and this kind of interaction. That is to say, at the end, we will have a poor penetration. And I will come back to that later on. Electron, when they will be in contact with interaction with a matter, we lose most of the energy by ionizing the atom. And I will come back later on as well. On the other side, the X-ray, the gamma ray, are a photon. So a photon is really what we call a quantum of light. It is a, that means it represents any electromagnetic radiation directly from the sun, directly from other, I would say, emitting radiation sources we can have worldwide. And it's important to have in mind as well that a photon carries energy, a very high energy, properly, proportionally directly to their radiation frequency. And compared to the to the electron, it's important to have in mind uh, as well that photons have no charge and no mass. That means that the interaction with the matter is much less reduced compared to an electron. Uh, for, yes, an electron. But once again, photons we lose energy by ionizing atom, and we will come back to that later. So that means electron will be, of course, for the electron beam radiation processing and photon will be for the gamma or x-ray processing. Of course, we have to keep in mind that a photon is a photon anyway. So both gamma and x-ray are photon are electromagnetic energy. Why finally we can say there are different names? It is because they differ in terms of origin. You know, may know 
that the gamma rays, for instance, originate directly from the radioactive decay of an atom. In our case, it is a cobalt-60. And due to this decay, it produces, uh, I would say during this radioactive decay, what we call the gamma photon. While for the X-ray, it is due to the transition on an electron from an atom or what we call a Bramstrom Bramstrahlung effect. That is to say one elect high energy electron are in close vicinity of some atom. In that case, they can slow down their motion and emit uh, X-ray through the Bramstrahlung um, effect. But at the end, either the gamma or the X photon does not know what they call each other. They are photon, high energy photon. And now if we dive just a little bit into the radiation interaction with the matter, I think it's really important to have in mind that this kind of high energy photon are really able to indeed to what we call provoke ionization of the matter, ionization of the atom, because they are able to directly go inside the atom, directly in the electrolytic cloud of any atom. But of course, we will play with photon with energy in that case, not so far away, but far, a little bit below what we call in that case the nuclear bond, not to provoke any uh, radioactivity. But compared to UV, for instance, it could be used through the sterilization, but it could be used only for the sterilization of surface. Why you know that UV, and for instance, we can see the rainbow of sunlight here doesn't have, for instance, the capability of penetrating matter, but just touching the surface. It is really the main difference between the high energy photon capable of touching really the art of the electronic cloud of atom, in that case, provoke immunization and really deep into the matter. So now what are the main, I would say, interaction processes you can find? So it doesn't, once again, you do not need to retain everything, but just at the end that whatever the rising radiation we'll be talking about, the process is more or less to always the same thing. That means that uh, the incident X-rays or gamma rays will be interacting with atom and through the Compton effect and will eject what we call secondary electron. And this cascade of ejected electron would be definitively the process or for the matter to absorb the energy, the in initial energy, I would say, brought by the X-ray or the gamma rays. At the end, it is really the ejected electron who will carry out the, the energy and will deposit step by step the dose into the, our product. And we'll come back to that after. Okay, so it is really, I would say, uh, an overview of the fundamental physics uh, we have seen. And just to, as a reminder, that we'll be talking about photon with gamma rays and X-ray and electron with electron beam. And the purpose is to, was to show you that at the end, the interaction between gamma and X-ray is the same with the matter and uh, leading to the cascade of reaction with E-beam as well. So now we will step by step go into the three technologies and to show you what could be the similarities and some differences. So first of all, let's start with the gamma rays. So as I said, the gamma rays are emitted what we call a radioactivity uh, element called the cobalt-60. And that means that in all gamma plants, we have some cobalt-60 matter, which is a radioactivity, a radioactive matter. In this picture, what you can see in a very beautiful bluish, I would say, uh, uh, element, it is really to the, the pencil, the source of the cobalt-60. Uh, cobalt and the main, I would say, things we need to keep in mind with, of course, the gamma radiation, the, the gamma rays, it is they can penetrate into the product, into all the packaging to kill all the microorganisms. There is very small increase of temperature inside the matter. There is no residue inside, and there is no specific preparation needed, indeed for the packaging, for the product to be submitted to such an irradiation process. But of course, in that case, we need to 
have radiation resistant material to be sure that at the end it doesn't provoke a uh, provoke sorry a brightness of the material submitted to this kind of radiation and i will come back to that later on the main benefits of course of this gamma ray technology is quite simple you just have to submit a product to put this in front of the gamma source to be radiated to be sterilized to be modified and this is this is very efficient and if you respect strictly all the safety i would say standard and so on it's at the end we can say it's perfectly well and for that i completely refer to the presentation eve gave a few weeks ago where he largely spoke about that and of course it is also the kind of versatility the gamma technology can treat a lot a lot of different product natures without a specific i would say preparation for that so that means that at the end the gamma technology very well suited for the sterilization of single use product of packaging product of food product of pharmaceutical product of implants and so on and so on everything we need to be sterilized everything radiation resistant could be sterilized by gamma rays so if we go uh, i will see quickly in an installation of the gamma radiator so we can say that uh, the art of course uh, is the source the, the, the gamma source and it is most of the time the gamma source is uh, when it is uh, not used it is in the water pool in that case and when uh, we would like to submit and to treat some palettes or, or some products you need to lift up all the gamma source to be just in front of course of the product to be irradiated and in that case of course the gamma source emits in all direction gamma rays and of course the product receives that and the proof course is to get a conveyor and to convey all the product step by step to be as close to vicinity as possible to the gamma source to be irradiated at the end it is a uh, of course, you can have different configuration of the conveyor, you can have different configuration of the totes, but the principle remains the same in all configurations. So currently, um, as I said previously, there are approximately uh, 200, 250 commercial uh, installations worldwide in more than uh, 50 uh, countries uh, in, in um, 2017, for instance, uh, is roughly we had a gamma capacity of 400 million curries for the sterilization purpose when or treating approximately 10 million of cubic meters of product where half of it are currently used for the medical device uh, sterilization and the other half for other sterilization uh, sterilization or disinfection of other products Now, if we go to the electron beam technology. So the electron beam is really produced in that case by streaming electron throughout an accelerator. So the purpose is really to inject electron into accelerator and to make them reach at the end the desired energy. And as soon as they have the desired energy, they are released to, of course, to sterilize to irradiate product. Worldwide, we can say that there are many electron being um, accelerator commercially available. The purpose is not to make you an exhaustive view, but for sure, this is a, you can find that uh, easily in, in the net. And you can see that will show you some example later on. What is Really important is the energy rent we can have for this kind of technology. So we, for the electron beam uh, technology, we can have uh, some energy ranging from 100, from 100 keV up to typically 10 eMeV. And we can have quite a large uh, power range as well, ranging from 0 0.5 kilowatt to more than 500 kilowatt. So here, I would like to emphasize not to make the confusion between the intrinsic energy of the electron, of one electron, that is to say the real energy one electron can convey, compared to the power of the installation, that is to say how many electrons, for instance, the machine can deliver per second. 
So this is really important to have in mind that it's conveyed directly to the energy of the electron. This is conveyed directly to the machine. And uh, we can have, of course, uh, other energy, but most of the time for industrial application, we don't go above 20, uh, 15 MeV due to the fact that uh, above that it can induce radioactivity in some metallic, metallic parts. As I said, uh, um, you can have different uh, electron uh, beam accelerator available worldwide. So we can have one with low energy, but as soon as we speak with quite high energy, what you can see is that the size, of course, of this machine uh, becomes to be quite big. So excited a couple of meters each time. One of the key characteristics of uh, this uh, technology is its ability to work especially with boxes, but not with pallets, due to the fact that depending on the intrinsic of the electron energy, the penetration capac capacity is quite low. For instance, with the electron energy below one MeV, you can see that we can penetrate only a couple of millimeters in, in water, why, if we would like to deal with quite high uh, energy, in that case, you can penetrate through a couple of centimeters. So that means that really the penetration capability of this or this electron really is a restricting element we need to have in mind, I would say, prior to this implementation, if we would like, of course, to use that for large palettes, it won't be possible. The uh, electron, of course, the E-beam could be used not only to sterilize, but to do also uh, surface coating, cross-linking, depending on the initial energy, and of course, to do sterilization and modification on purpose on some polymers. Okay, now let's go to the X-ray uh, technology. First of all, we need to have in mind, as I said previously, that to get X-ray at the end, we need to start from uh, electron accelerator, EBM accelerator. The purpose is really to convert here the electron to X-ray. So in that case, uh, I will focus only on, on my presentation on two cases where we can see a uh, rhodotron and the line axe. It is a cylinder, I would say accelerator, it is a linear accelerator, but the purpose is the same, really, at the end, to accelerate the electron and to convert them through a converter, made most of the time with a tantalum plate, and in that case, once the conversion is done to emit X-ray in the other side, of course, of the scan on, in that case, where we can see some product to be sterilized or eliminated. The, the principle, of course, is the same whatever the, whatever the accelerator. Once again, we need to generate electrons to make them gain um, energy. And at the end, you can see that in that case of the rotor, the purpose is really to make them accelerate until they can reach the desired energy. When they achieve the desired energy, of course, the purpose is to make them transported through the uh, beam line and to be directly converted through a tantalum plate, where in that case, the photon could be emitted. Just one example here, uh, briefly, when you can see that uh, uh, you, you have a cylinder uh, accelerator here, the um, E-beam and the electron are transported through the beam line and after it is converted here through the tantalum plate and as I said, here you can have all the product to be treated. Okay. Now I give you um, I gave you an overview about the three technologies. I would like now to compare, I would say the three technology and how they can be used and what are the main similarities and the main differences between the technologies and uh, what how we should have that in mind. So first of all, of course, uh, as I said many times, the really the main difference we can have at the output of this technology is really the penetration capability. With E-beam, the penetration capability is quite low. That is to say, we can only irradiate quite thin 
and we say matter was with gamma and x-ray. In that case, we can have a very high penetration capability. In that case, we can, of course, irradiate or sterilize palette at once. If we now compare how it works, if we take an example of the sterilization, and if you have, for instance, a cobalt source, I would say in, in blue, the purpose, of course, is to put all the product to be treated as close vicinity as possible to capture all the gamma rays, which could be randomly emitted by the gamma source and to make all the product to uh, turn around and to be sure that at the end we can get the greatest dose uniformity. For the E-beam and the X-ray, the principle, of course, is the same. You need to, as I said, here to irradiate, you can only irradiate palettes, but the purpose, of course, with X-ray, we can sterilize, irradiate palettes at once. And here it is a uh, done from the top, but of course it, done, it can done from the edge and from the side. And in that case, we will more or less exactly the same process with the gamma and the X-ray. And it is definitely the main advantage with the photon-based uh, technology. In that case, we can have more or less a copy-paste of the different processes we already know from some decade with the gamma treatment. Now, if we compare the, the energy, and I think we had a lot of questions regarding what could be the differences regarding the old energy used in that case with the three technologies. Well, we can see that for the E-beam, it is in blue here, with that with, we have very narrow peak center to the 10 MeV, while for the X-ray in well, we can see that we have a full spectrum of energy almost starting to zero up to seven, seven, uh, seven and a half MeV. Why for the gamma, we have the two characteristic peaks, so we can have close to 1.2, 1.3 MeV. But on the whole, like we can see that we are greatly 0 0.1 MeV, which we could could can be considered either ionizing threshold for many of our matter to be irradiated and to be sterilized. So that as soon as we are greater than that, we can see that at the end, there will be possibility to ionize and possibility to sterilize. And we can see that we are completely in the safe side. And it is really the main, main advantage of all these radiation technologies. Now, you might know indeed uh, in the market why we should use only the cobalt 60 and not other radioactive element. So it should just now say, uh, I would say, a note beside that. So indeed, what you can see that with the cobalt 60, as I just spoke in the slide before, we have very high energy, more than one MeV, which is not exactly the case, especially for the other elements mentioned here. But one, the other advantage of the cobalt 60 is advantage and drawback sometimes, of course, is the fact that the half lifetime, of course, of this material is quite short, but that means that it emits a lot, a lot of uh, decay per second, a lot, a lot of uh, gamma rays per second, and it means that the activity for one specific gram of material is very high. And that's why it's very appreciated for such, I would say, sterilization or irradiation aspect in that case. So as I said, for with a gamma ray, we have uh, energy more close to 1, 1.2 MeV. With E-beam, we have energy between 5 and 10 MeV, but typically for the sterilization, it's rather 10 MeV. For the X-ray, we can have 5 or 7.5 EUV, but for the sterilization, definitely rather 7, 7.5 EMV. And as I said previously, uh, for an all industrial application, completely avoid using higher energy than 12 or 15 EMV due to the fact it could induce radioactivity, some metallic parts. So now, if we compare, um, I would say, um, side by side, all the different technology and how it could be used. So I think it's really important to have in mind that in any case, we will be dealing with ionizing irradiation, harmful ionization, um, if it is not properly handled. So that means in all cases, we need a bunker, 
where there is inside a maze, of course, to avoid the either the photon or the uh, e-beam to escape. And the main differentiation between the gamma and the uh, X-ray and E-beam is real dictionality. As I said previously, the gamma source emits randomly in all direction uh, some gamma rays, while with X-ray and E-beam, we have a rather unidirectional, I would say, emission of the beam uh, later on. The other difference right of course on the dose rate. We know that with the gamma process it is quite a slow dose rate, typically ranging between one and ten kilograms per hour, while with X-ray, of course, it is a little bit higher, typically between fifty and one hundred kilograms per hour. While it is definitely the greatest advantage of the beam, we could have huge dose rate, typically more than several thousand um, I would say kilograms per hour. With uh, regarding the penetration and of course directly the dose uniformity, we know that gamma, with gamma and X-ray we have a very good penetration. In that case, a very good dose uniformity. Why it is quite a restriction of the beam technology. In that case, the penetration is quite weak and the dose uniformity, of course, is to be considered. I would say properly doing the dose mapping. Uh, for the X-ray and gamma process, once again, the temperature elevation is not that high. Why for the E-beam, depending especially on the matter and, the, and considering the high dose rate, we need uh, the, the energy deposited in very small short time is so high that sometimes we could expect to have a great elevation of uh, temperature. But it's really depending on the matter and it's really, really under um, it happens really during the irradiation, the sterilization. So just a, a question beside, of course, uh, I had some questions. So finally, what is a dose? So to explain once again, what is a dose and, and to come back to that, I think it is important to have in mind that once again, the physics the, is the same between gamma and X-ray and later on between the E-beam. But uh, first of all, we need to have a consideration that uh, all the gamma rays and the X-rays will interact uh, with the atom and will provoke the, through the quantum effect ionization, that is to say, an ejection of what we call secondary electron and later on, of course, through the creation of radicals and definitively, the process later on, how the dose is deposited, depends directly on this uh, secondary or primary electron if we talk about E-beam technology. And step by step, all the electron cannot escape from the matter and will deposit step by step all their energy until they are completely absorbed. And in that case, uh, it is directly linked to, of course, the, the, the number of gamma rays or X-ray which could be emitted, of course, per second. The, the dose could be uh, read, of course, with some dosimetry system. And I think everybody, everybody uh, may know that, that now, among others, we might have, of course, the aline one. In that case, it is very sensitive and it works with the ES, ESR spectrometry. And the other side, we have also the very well-known CTA. In that case, we work with spectrophotometry. So it is really here an overview of the different uh, technology and what could be the similarities and uh, the differences. So if we try to summarize, of course, uh, uh, regarding the penetration capability with E-beam, we have a quite low penetration capability. It restricts definitively the dimension of the product to be uh, irradiated, sterilized, while with gamma and X-ray, we can sterilize easily, irradiate full pilots, of course. Directly looking to that, that means the dose uniformity ratio uh, could be quite good with E-beam, but definitely is better with E-beam and gamma. And that means we need uh, hours to sterilize with uh, gamma and X-ray, where we need minutes. And I will come back to that, but it is really important for instance to have in mind that for the sterilization processes, of course, everything, all the three technologies are perfectly well covered by this ISO standard. That means also, for the product um, homogeneity, non-homogeneity uh, for E-beam due to the fact it is uh, very well absorbed, it is uh, not so well, I would say, uh, tolerant for the 
non-homogeneity inside the boxes, why for gamma and x-ray it doesn't matter. And as I said previously, we can have a high evaluation of terminal temperature with H1 beam, Y4 X-ray and E-beam, we have typically a small uh, uh, temperature elevation. Why at the end, we could expect also a good polymer acceptability. And I will come back to that later on as well. Now, finally, what could be um, the application and the main application and the main benefits of uh, all these radiation technologies? There are many applications, many, many applications. Uh, the, the, sorry, the purpose is not to describe everything. Otherwise, I will spend hours describing you everything. But just to mention the main categories where radiation processing could be used. So we could, this radiation processing could be used, for instance, in, in the environment to do some water waste treatment, some salt treatment, and so on. Of course, the radiation processing could be used for the healthcare product, especially for the sterilization, and I will come back later on. It could be used also for the cultural aerosol preservation, in that case, uh, consolidation, disinfection, cleaning, and the case many, uh, we can see many examples where uh, Egypt, uh, Egyptian mummies have been treated by such a radiation processing to disinfect them at the end. We could have also, uh, it could be used also in agriculture, uh, in that case to control the insect population, and we also to uh, do some food treatment, some fertilizer product, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, least but not last, uh, last but not least, sorry, it could be also, of course, for the cross-linking of some polymer material for the tires and some for some some gemstones. So. I will be giving only a few examples of them, and I will definitively focus on the sterilization later on on my presentation. So um, here, uh, if you like, I think it's really important if you look, have a look on details about which, as much application, where, from, what kind of application uh, could be uh, completely derived from this radiation processing. I completely refer to the fourth webinar I would say provided by Dagmara uh, a couple of weeks ago as well, where she gave a detail of everything. But just here, for example, for instance, for the food erodation, of course, for it is a very well-known processes. We could use also the radiation processing for, in that case, the polymer modification on purpose, I would say, that is to say to the cross-linking or wider tubing and so other, uh, I would say, uh, uh, polymer films and so on. It is really in that case, the purpose is to submit a polymer to uh, rotations in that case to provoke the modification, the cross-linking to achieve at the end the desired property of the cross-linked or modified polymer. So it is very an important field, of course, of the electron beam technology. We have, of course, the sterilization, and I think it is uh, greatly known that it is one of the key, I would put as a key application of the use of the gamma and the X-ray upcoming, of course. And uh, here we can uh, cite and mention only, for instance, the medical device, sterilization, some cosmetics, some pharmaceutical, and of course, a great, great portion as well of a single use system in made of plastics for the um, manufacturing of biopharmaceuticals. So, and I would like to make also a small focus as well on that uh, because I think it really uh, rise up a lot of, I would say, uh, volume and concern step by step. So first of all, you, you may know that uh, to be able to uh, manufacture some biologic or some vaccine, more and more you need to do that by the way of cell culture. And uh, that is to say asking living cells to produce big proteins directly, sorry, directly producing, of course, the molecule of interest, uh, that is to say monoclonal antibodies, vaccine, and so on. But to be able to produce so, of course, that means that at each step of the process, we need to get some sterile product. So it's just a small picture of where sterile single-use product could be used. So everywhere in yellow represent 
for instance, uh, some products, um, uh, sorry, except uh, of course the shirt and the tie, but everything else of course represents some product where we need definitely some sterile product to, to be used in such uh, complex manufacturing of important molecules of interest. So that mean, um, I think it's really right some I will say some question, how we can say that at the end, coming back to one of the first comments, I said that we need to select, of course, rotational resistant matter. That is, at the end, we need to be sure that we can get the desired performances at the end, of course, of the radiation, either for time force cross-linking or at the end of the sterilization. We need to check definitively that all the components to be used, all the matter to be used, could be indeed, I would say, eligible, could be also resistant to gamma uh, or gamma, either gamma X-ray or even sometimes E-beam. We need to be sure that at the end, all the functionalities can be kept up to the end of the shelf life. And not but close this, and I will come back later on, of course, we need to be sure, especially in the case of the sterilization process, that we can guarantee, of course, the sterility uh, up to the end of the shelf life once again. So if we combine everything at the end, of course, we can say that a product could be eligible and could be submitted to all the different technologies. So I would say that some product cannot be claimed, I would say, are eligible for all the technologies, not because most of the time it, we fail to be to prove so, but because most of the time we don't have the necessary data to prove so. So I really engage each of us, I would say definitively here to share and to publish data. So, so step by step, all the community to be sure that at the end we can claim that the final project made of many, many polymers could be used, I would say, in a universal way. So let's now make a focus on the sterility. So of course, the purpose uh, of these radiation technology when they are used or, or in the sterilization purpose is really to get the sterility. But it's worth mentioning once again that the sterility could be achieved either using gamma rays or X-rays or E-beam. The purpose is the same and the processes are the same. That is to say that all ionizing radiation have the capability to disrupt all the biological events coming up in the microorganisms provoking at the end their death, of course, at the purpose. A dose is a dose, whatever the radiation technology, 25 kilograms typically used in a biopharma single dose product, for instance, it could be also achieved whatever the radiation technology. It is important to keep that in mind. Now, regarding um, what could be the effect of all the radiation and their respective technology on the microbicidal effectiveness, I think it has been usually described in the literature. And here I provided you two examples of two uh, recent papers. And I know that there is published another paper uh, last month as well on the same topic, proving exactly the same thing. But the microbicidal effectiveness or all ionizing radiation is really have been already proven and you can definitively refer to, to that existing literature. No need to restart from the scratch at all. Now regarding all the requirements and to be sure that at the end we can claim of course the sterility and here once again we need to refer to the very well known ISO standard 11137. This ISO standard completely describes how to do, how to deal and how we can claim the currency but as well I think I would like to emphasize it is possible to do so whatever the radiation technology we will be using. That is to say, either with gamma, either with X-ray, either with EB is important. Once again, a dose is a dose. And if you a sterilization validation method has been the VD max with 25 kilo, it could be achieved with the three irradiation technologies. There, we were 
some similarities and some differences, some particularities I would like to mention regarding the, uh, the three radiation technologies. First of all, uh, it is very well described in the ISO standard. As soon as we will be dealing with the X-ray in that case, you, you need to check that at the end, no radioactivity is unknown, what we call uh, the, the activation. Secondly, we need to check and to establish what could be the sterilization dose. And uh, lastly, you need to check or establish what could be the maximum dose. So I would like to go through, uh, quickly through the three points mentioned here to give you the similarities and the differences between the, of course, once again, the radiation technologies. So first of all, regarding the activation, as I said, it's only related to the use of the X-ray in that case. As soon as you will be using X-ray with energy above 5 MeV in that case, you need to demonstrate that the product to be ready to be sterilized could be of proper use. Once again, we do not start from scratch. Uh, it is already known from literature that the plastic materials are not expected to pose any of concern regarding uh, the activation, but we rather uh, need to focus on some impurities inside the plastic or some other uh, materials such as the metal and, and, and so on. So to be sure and uh, that uh, we the, the, the use of uh, X-ray technology do, do not provoke any concern at the end, we perform some verification once again uh, on some representative product uh, and uh, containing in that case stainless steel part, ceramic parts, other metallic parts, and I would say worst case item in that case freshly irradiated with a 7 MeV X-ray that to be sure that at the end, of course, we could be in the safe stab. So far, so good, of course, and we can say that uh, from our organization, from the, all the study which has been performed, we can see that uh, no external uh, exposure has been highlighted. It is, uh, and it is also the case with other studies we can have from other organizations which uh, have drawn exactly the same conclusion. Secondly, uh, you need, of course, whatever in that case, the evaluation technology to define uh, the minimum sterilization dose. But once again, I'm pretty sure that in most cases, uh, you either already sterilized with gamma or maybe with E-beam and so you have already, I would say, uh, validated what could be what we call the initial burden level. And in that case, identifying what could be the type and the nature of the microorganisms and what could be, of course, the quantity. That means to say that the processing of uh, um, establishing what could be the sterilization is the same, whatever, once again, the radiation technology you will be, be using at the end. Um, we need also to uh, perform, of course, a performance qualification or a dose mapping. Here, no transfer is possible. You may know that in all cases, we can say that um, for each X-ray site, for each gamma site for each EB site, we can say that from site to site, the configuration, the installation are different. So in that mean, it means that we definitely need to redo for each site, for each product family, product definition, and so on, the dose mapping. It has, it's perfectly well described once again in this ISO standard, either you use gamma X-ray or EB. That mean, and you need to prove, and if we take the example of, in that case of uh, biopharma product, single user uh, biopharma product, we need to prove that uh, in the process, you would be in the range of 25, 45. And of course, uh, the third point, uh, the f uh, one of the third requirement perfectly well described by one of the requirements well described by the ISO standard, otherwise we need to describe what could be the maximum acceptable dose. So I would say, uh, I have some question in the past coming, what, what truly the maximum acceptable dose? Of course, the purpose here is not to demonstrate that at the end, your product can withstand up to maybe 1000 kilograms. Is not the purpose at all when we know that we need a minimum dose of 25 everywhere. 
is really to be able that at the max dose bracketing your sterilization dose range at the end where you can keep of course all the performances all the robustness of the product to be sterilized to be eradicated to up to the end of the shelf life and definitely is the purpose of the establishment and the transfer of this maximum acceptable dose once of course it is not in one radiation technology it could be transfer to the other one by performing a worst case assessment, really focusing on worst case item once again a worst case result without the need to repeat everything at each time so here uh, um, com completely advise you to read all the bpsa uh, x-ray paper one describing a general holistic approach how it would be possible to do so of course uh, um, as I spoke previously, one of the drawbacks of, of uh, the use of ionizing radiation is really the, the fact we can induce some modification, um, modification upon irradiation. So we can have some chemical changes, that is to say we can provoke some transition conflicting, but in that case not on purpose, we can have some oxidation and so on. On the other side, we can provoke some physical changes. We need to consideration. That is to say, we can change maybe the flexibility or induce some brightness. We can induce some discoloration and so forth. And that means we need definitively to take that into account when I would say uh, moving forward into the use of such a short, short radiation technology. Once again, we do not start from scratch. And I think uh, it is very well known once again. And I think it, um, I usually describe that the fundamental physics uh, uh, describing the interaction between gamma and X-ray with the matter is identical. That is to say that, for instance, as soon as you are in polymer, as soon as you submit this polymer to radiation, you will create what we call radical and in that case, you will induce a cascade of reaction. No need to further describe that. If you would like to go, I give you all the time, all the different papers you can refer to describing into detail what could be the chemical cascade of reaction, I would say, induced by this first level of radical present into the material. But uh, as the interaction as the same, definitively we can expect the radical to be the same and the cascade of reaction to be the same between all the radiation technologies and even we talk small focus for a stand of the extractable which is very of importance for the healthcare product in that case we can expect them to be also equivalent whatever the technology used at the end and of course we can expect also to have an equivalent uh, chemical uh, compatibility whatever the, the processing used so one of the challenge, of course, and I was, we can say so, of course, was to be able to say, OK, as we know that uh, from theoretical physics, once again, from theoretical chemistry, we know that uh, we definitely should have exactly the same interaction, the same physics of interaction, I would say, between gamma and X. But here we wanted to once again generate and to prove to the to the community that at the end we can have exactly the same event indeed uh, or inside the material and i think it was really key to to we uh, to be able to track as i said the generation of radical i would say directly occurring from the ionization event occurring directly from the direct interaction with gamma and x-ray and of course in beam as well and in that case we track the radical generated upon irradiation with in that case gamma and x-ray and we uh, emphasize that at the end whatever the material we obtain the same nature of the radical with the same quantity approving at the end once again that uh, the interaction between gamma and x-ray with the matter is the same One of the key questions, and once again, I refer to the full community here, and we had a lot of, we had a lot of questions regarding what mean at the equivalency. So for instance, in my organization, we develop some uh, equivalency act acceptance criteria 
to say between I would say taking into account all the uncertainties of measurement and all the sampling and so forth that at the end when we have two mathematical results we can claim the equivalency. But I strongly encourage other I would say folks in the community also to publish in this case I would say to step by step I would say fine tune all the equivalency state or the equivalency criteria in that case definitively we can strengthen I would say this interchangeability of course of uh, uh, material resistance to all I would say radiation technology step by step and to complete the full picture in that case. And once again, um, I would say we will start out from scratch. We know, of course, that uh, when we need to develop a product, when the intended use, of course, is to be delivered sterile, we need definitively to take the sterilization as a complete uh, um, development phase, of course, of the full product development. That that means that definitively we need to take in consideration from each type of the development how we can stay and how we can be sure that at the end we can use a rotation resistant product and so forth. And here I just gave one example I gave and uh, I gave also some references how we can possible to, I would say, to, to do some decision making for each stage of the development. And I refer to, of course, uh, to this, uh, this DIR as well. And this, uh, of course, uh, the, the purpose of, of that also is to say that either you use gamma or three, it should be taken right at the beginning, of course. And of course, regarding the intangibility of the different technology, we are not alone. So definitively, if we come back, for instance, into the manufacturing of biologic of any active pharmaceutical ingredient, that is to say vaccine on other uh, biologics, the purpose is really to be able to work with a lot, fine, we need to work with a lot of matter. We need to work with a lot of different component resins and so forth. And us as integrator, we need, of course, to provide sterile, or of course, at the end product, but to be sure that at the end it fulfills the final requirement of the patient safety. So uh, I would say strict evaluation of the biomanufacturer and the regulators. And to be sure, of course, it will be possible with a hundred or even thousand of components on metal to be used definitively. We need to be all together and to be sure that we understand properly all the radiation physics, all the chemistry, all the materials science and on and so on, and we publish so. So it is already already the case, of course, through, for instance, the ex, ex Marseille University, through the PNNL and, and with the Team Nablo, through different industry groups like uh, the BPSA and the, uh, and the Bioform and through other association. So definitely that's the purpose to show the interchangeability step by step of all, I would say, and to extend that to greater number of polymer at the end to ease this interchangeability. Once again, uh, I would like to emphasize that we do not start from scratch. So whatever the radiation technology will be using, of course, some, I would say some paper, and I refer to the one of the first one, I found it was really published in 1998, in that case for the use of, of in New lab plant, but in that matter, polymer is a polymer and a photon is a photon. And at the end, we can say that we can have, we can definitively refer to existing uh, literature, giving already a good hint how some poly, um, polymers could withstand to such um, uh, uh, irradiation, such sterilization, and finally, regardless of the initial source of uh, either the photon or, or the electrons. Okay, now I would like to go to the final part of my talk is to give you some trend and upcoming, I would say, development we, uh, I would like to share with you. One of the first one is really to uh, to bring some simulation, I would say, in all the radiation processing. So we, of course, 
as I said, we have a lot of concern doing, of course, all the dust mapping is quite extensive, is very long work and extensive work. It is fundamental. But also it is important to have in mind if it is possible to check right at the beginning of the development without necessarily having prototype in end, how, for instance, such or such uh, component could be uh, what could be the dose uh, deposited on such specific component? Uh, why we don't have exactly the prototype in hand? So for that, I strongly also uh, would like to integrate step by step uh, in all processes uh, for the simulation implementation as well. And uh, with the consumption of the different uh, stakeholder you can see here, we develop a proof of concept, indeed a quite a complex uh, uh, product in, indeed uh, involving uh, many components to being stainless steel and many plastics as well, uh, ceramics, magnet, and so on. We were able to have a good match between a true dose mapping and a virtual dose mapping, and in case it was a true success. So I strongly, uh, I would say now, would like to, uh, I would like to spread out this method to be sure that it is, I would say, used in upcoming future for this uh, rotation processing. Sorry. Also, one of the upcoming applications we might foresee as well is really, we know that, uh, for instance, uh, addition processing could be used for the treatment of water and sludge as well. But uh, if there also a possibility, uh, or I would say, for the plastic recycling, so we saw that is, uh, there are some possibilities, of course, for the plastic modification. But can we adapt, in that case, these technologies? Uh, to make to recycle plastic, and that's why some initiatives uh, have been already undertaken by some group I refer to here, and to be able maybe in the near future to I would say to recycle plastic and to avoid I would say and to depolute uh, so, some uh, medium at the end. Last but not least, of course, uh, one of the key challenges uh, we need, of course, to take into account uh, when we'll be uh, developing one product, either I would say plastic product or polymer product, is really what we do with how we can treat, of course, the end of the um, product life cycle, or, of course, of whatever I would say the application at the end. So definitely need here to take into consideration that, as I said, the sterilization is part definitively of the manufacturing process, of course, of the delivery of appropriate uh, product, I would say, for the intended use. And definitively, I would say, step by step, we need to consider not only the energy we need to, how we need to manufacture, to ship, and to transform, of course, the product, but we need also to consider, I would say, what could be the impact at that stage. So here, definitively, I refer to the scope three of this uh, sustainability evaluation, where in that case, we would be needed to compare side by side what could be the impact of the X-ray E-beam or compared to the gamma processes where maybe we are able to do, not to select, but maybe to optimize step by step what could be the best through to uh, increase, I would say, the throughput at the end where we can see some optimization and, and of course, to reduce our environmental impact on that and to gain into sustainability. And once again, I would say that definitively we need uh, each of us to think about that and to solve step by step uh, this, uh, I would say, this concern. So, um, as a conclusion of my talk today, I would say that definitively uh, regarding the sterilization, and uh, not only that now we can see that uh, the gamma, the e beam or the technology X-ray uh, could be seen definitively are uh, mature technologies, of course, and this could be definitively uh, I would say could be used in intangible way, I would say, to jump from one sterilization uh, method to another. So I, once again, uh, uh, everything regarding the sterility um, has been discussed intensively, I, I guess, today. But uh, whatever the radiation technology used at the end, we can achieve the sterilization. And everything is described in the ISO standard once again. And uh, of course, we need to think uh, of future future regarding any potential new application to have in mind 
there is a sustainability and to uh, involve uh, maybe other tool, other way of thinking with the simulation and uh, to share as much as we can, of course, all the data to be sure that we get definitively into efficiency for everybody. So on that, uh, I would like to thank you for attention. If you have any question now, please feel free to ask.